time is money, right? And I value my time. I think time is almost more valuable than money. You, it's something you don't get back. You can't make up for it. So anything that saves me time is always going to be a winner. So whether that's an app, using an accountant, or using a system that automates your finances, I'm all for it. And actually, the automation thing is something that everyone can do, whether you're a freelancer or self-employed. Everyone should have automation. Like set up a direct debit, set up a standing order for your savings so you never forget money to go into your savings. Welcome to the Sonia Barlow Show. My name is Sonia Barlow and I am the host of this very authentic audio and video based podcast. Ultimately, I wanted to interview ordinary people who are becoming extraordinary all over the world. It's me, my camera and my recorder sharing real life, authentic interviews with people on the ground. I really wanted to create something which doesn't necessarily exist on the internet today. And that's no noise, no clutter, to the point conversations with very cool people all over the world. Most of our content, if not all of it, is directed by you, our listener, our watcher, and our audience member. So thank you. If you have any questions that you want to answer, if you want to be a part of the show, or if you're just interested in where we're traveling next, drop me a line, hello at soniabarlow.co.uk or at soniabarlow.uk. I won't keep you any longer because we have amazing interviews lined up from people all over the world. So let's get straight into the chat. Welcome to the NMF Network podcast, Kalpana. Have I said that correctly? Kalpana. Kalpana. I've been saying it correctly this whole time. I've been saying it correctly and then the camera came and I was like, oh my God, I'm going to turn into one of those people that can't pronounce Don't names. Worry. Kalpana, I'm really sorry, but That's welcome. Okay. I'm going to keep this in because name pronunciation is key. Thank you so much for joining us. I've been fangirling from afar for a while now, so I'm glad that I can bring you onto the oh, couch. good to meet you as well. Uh, so I obviously know what you do and what you get up to, but let's just introduce yourself to our viewers and then we'll get going. Yeah, so I'm Kalpana Fitzpatrick. I'm a financial journalist and author. In my day-to-day -day, um, activities, I'm digital editor of a finance mag um, online of uh, Money Week and I write various money columns and doing loads of other stuff about talking about money all the time and always thinking about the next book, which is important. Kalpana, so money is a really important topic and if anything, money rules the world. I do feel like recently we've seen a lot more conversation around money, a lot more noise, a lot more information. It's as if one day we woke up and we all decided as a society that we don't know enough about finances. Now everyone thinks they're a finance guru. Yeah. How did you get into the work in which you're doing? And I guess for everyone watching or listening, what makes you the creditable source to go to? So I've been doing financial journalism for probably almost 20 years, so way too long. I knew I wanted to do journalism, not necessarily finance journalism, but so like I think any finance journalist sitting here today will probably say I fell into it, right? So I fell into it, starting about writing about pensions, etc. I really got into it and I really started actually enjoying it and thinking, this is, actually, I've got a lot to learn myself, right? Because we don't learn finance at school. Critical thing, like, I learned straight away. It's like, well, why didn't anyone tell me about this? And then I just kind of like started doing it, trying loads of different things. It started at the Financial Times group, freelance for a while. I launched financing women's titles like Good Housekeeping, Red, Cosmo, and then sort of gone on to do uh, Money Week. Obviously, that comes on the back of my interest in investing. And I've just learned so much myself and in terms of also like what, you know, what people want to know about. So I think my background and the number of people that I speak to, I'm always like, as a journalist, you're used to researching your facts and, you know, what you say is, is well researched and accurate. And what you're saying also about the fact that people have almost woken up to the importance of finances, right? Um, well, there's, the trigger points have been the pandemic. People realise that actually having strong finances in place is important or they all of a sudden come to realise that, oh, isn't it nice to have some savings because people didn't spend during the pandemic, but then people went and spent it all. But then now we've had the cost of living hit us as well. So again, people are feeling actually financial resilience is an important thing, but we don't know how this works or X, Y, and Z. And I think the need for financial literacy has also really 
been highlighted in the last few years. I still don't understand why children come out of school not knowing what pension is or what mortgage is or how it works or they have to check their credit score, yet they all know how to go and spend money and get into debt. So um, I think I'm hoping the world is changing and I'm really glad to be part of that change as we go forward. It's also really interesting that we have woken up to finance. We've also woken up to this mass consumption of social media trends that are going on day to day. One thing that I realized, especially when you go on like TikTok, is people think that it's really easy, therefore, to make 5K, 10K, 15K a month, but they don't know what to do with that money. They don't know how to reinvest. They don't know how to invest. They don't know how to grow that wealth. And I'm not going to pretend like I did or I knew either. Like I spent a lot during university, right? I also had a part-time job. I took out the loans. I went and did the hustle. And now I'm paying back the loans being like, hey, hold on. Why did no one remind me that I could have actually paid off my student loan whilst I was at university and not taking the loan out? Or why has no one educated me on the fact that if I negotiate a 50K salary, my tax goes up 40%. But if it's 48K, it's still in the 20%. Small changes like that make a significant impact when you come from humble beginnings. Or even an ISA, like help to buy ISA, convert it to a lifetime ISA. There's a lot that's going on there. I do think that it's amazing that social media has allowed us to have all of this financial information. But I also think that there are people who are sharing false news and fake news and not doing their fact checking. Absolutely, yeah. How do you know the difference? So how can a consumer listening thinking, you know what, I really want to get into understanding more about finances. What are the first steps that they should be taking? So I think first it's really following people with credentials that is just so important. Uh, now, so, I'm really glad you've touched on social media because this is my bug bit. I've seen, and it really angers me actually. I've been seeing this on Instagram lately, like, you know, you get like a single mom saying, oh, I'm a single mom, but I make money. And then they're advertising match betting or something. And I was like, no, this is not how to make money or manage your finances. Or I think if someone's really pushing something, like they might be pushing a particular, what we call meme stocks, um, you know, that's just popular by social media, uh, be wary of that. We're talking about things like Bitcoin. When I talk to people about investing, for example, they all of a sudden open up this conversation about Bitcoins and I'm like, that's so far from what you need to be doing to build long-term wealth. But, but yeah, but I follow this guy on TikTok or Instagram and you know they make so much money and it's the vibe that gets built around it. But it's social media noise and knowing when it's social media noise or something that's actually reg- regulated, backed by facts, and also just, if you're following someone and they're saying something and it sounds, okay, so my rule of thumb is if it sounds too good to be true, it is, right? So step away. And I think what's really sad about it is that people are sometimes desperate or quite vulnerable. And again, it comes back to that lack of financial education. So if you are following someone, take a look at what their background is. Who are they? Why have they got the credentials to say what they're saying? Take it with a pinch of salt. Now we get what is labelled as influencers, right? Now, get labelled as influencers. Why have I never heard that before? Have you not heard this? I've not Uh, heard of influencers. Influencers, yes, they exist, right? They exist. But look deeper into what they're saying. On the front of it, they're all really putting out some really nice messages. Some of them are quite obvious, but then look deeper into what they're saying. And I've I've seen this all the time where. You know, they have really strong following and they look like they're saying all the right things. Look deeper and they're talking about things like match betting or, you know, try this, try that. But, or just really simple things that save you 20p or pound here and there. But actually what I'm really into is how do you build financial resilience? How do you make the right money moves that actually makes you stronger for the future? How do you build your long-term wealth? And all those messages are so important. But to do that, you need to be following the right people with the right credentials. And so, uh, you know, there are influencers that do, I can't say that now, and that do a good job, right? But you need to look into who they really are, what their background is, and why do they have the right to say what they're saying? And is it right that what they're saying? I would always say go to reputable sources. So there's a lot of websites, magazines that are out there that actually... And I always say this, and I say this in my book, financial journalists are absolutely brilliant financial educators. We do such a great job of educating our readers. Follow them and see what they're saying. And Do you have any advocates that you could sponsor today, be that, you know, magazines, publications, individuals? So there's so many, like, 
I love the BBC's money section. It is great. You know, all actually all of them, Telegraph, Time, and Sunday Times money sections is brilliant. And money Week, which I work for, is, you know, we're always putting out really great financial information to help people make good decisions. Books, there are great books out there. Uh, you know, there's FT money as well. They're not just, if you don't want to read, there are brilliant podcasts as well to listen to, to help you get, you know, understandings if you just want to have a little casual listen about something. But they're just trigger points. They're trigger points and really make you think, actually, what that film influencer will say was probably not right because I've not heard any of these journalists talk mm. about it. Well, one thing I wanted to touch on, especially because we're talking about trends and tech and credibility is, well, the reason I really want to touch on it, if I'm being really honest, is because I woke up today and we're filming this on the 21st of April and my blue tick was gone from Twitter. Okay. And this is why I really want to talk about it because I woke up today and I was decredited. Like, is that the right term? I'm not sure. But I definitely need wow. a moment just to talk about that, to say over the last few years, I've done the work, I've put in the effort. I was verified as a spokesperson, as someone who knows their stuff, as someone who has credibility, as someone who's trustworthy. And this morning, I felt like Twitter took that away from me. And it made me feel a certain way because, and the big because is, because now you don't really know the fact from the fiction. Yeah. And that, I believe, is going to be problematic moving forward. Yeah, so I noticed my blue tick had gone as well. So I really feel what you're saying. Are you as sad as I am? I'm not sure. <laughs> I am. I just actually felt, I don't know, I used the term, just felt my Twitter looked a bit naked today. And yeah, it just makes me think that, you know, it is so important that that blue tick was quite important in the sense of credibility, right? I knew that my followers could look at that and think, actually, what she's putting out is, is from a trusted source. And that was important. Um, I think it, it's, it's sad. It's sad that it's happened. Um, you know, you want to be verified on the basis that you are ticking certain boxes when it comes to, especially when it comes to news and especially when it comes to finance news. Dude, I do worry people won't be able to tell the fact from fiction and that is always going to be problematic, but more so now. So it's, yeah, it's sad. It's all good. I do feel, I feel it, I feel it. But I think that's my point. My point is if I'm online, and I'm now going and researching for a topic, I want to go to a trusted source. On a platform like Twitter, you don't necessarily know who that trusted source is because you don't just want the follow account. And what's happening with finance right now is people are going for the follow accounts, but not necessarily for the credentials or for the in individuals that have the investigatory background and experience. And that's creating a lot of noise in the ecosystem, a lot of echo chambers, a lot of gatekeeping. But then every second person has now got their own podcast, which is great for them. And we have one too, so it's not throwing shade. It's more like not everything needs to be visual, not everything needs to be a podcast, not everything needs to be a conversation here, but also it needs to be evergreen. Yeah. Something that you may say today in April and this podcast goes out in May or in June or in July, if someone listens back to it in 2025, might not make financial sense. Yeah. It may not bring them financial freedom. You also spoke about going into journalism and now going into finance journalism. Was there a trigger point or a trauma point that made you think I need to get better with money? Do you know what? Like I kind of just learned as I go along and I, I feel like I, you know, I spoke to a lot. I started in a B2B, I spoke to a lot of privileged people and yeah, I think I just learned. It was just the, the learning curve and it just, without actually having a certain trigger point, it just every tip and idea that I was picking up just help me build my um, knowledge and how I manage my money as well. But then I moved on to the consumer side of things and actually I thought it really want to help people as much as I can, help the everyday person on the street get better with their money. I, you know, I did a few things on television and just really enjoyed it, but also come to real, it was, for me, the driver is to realize just the real lack of knowledge out yes. there. And for me, I want to be part of that journey to improve that financial literacy. Was there a moment where it hit you personally? So what I mean by that is I lost my job in 2018, yeah. but I definitely lost my job in 2019, right? And in 2019, when I lost my job, I realized that I had gone from X amount in my bank yeah. to nothing. I had savings, but I wasn't now quite sure how to build that wealth because actually if money is just held in a pot, but inflation yeah. is rising, you're losing money day to day. Yeah. I think uh, in addition to that, I really wanted to buy a property. 
but it's super hard buying a property when you have no income or you're self-employed or you're a freelancer because you don't have that stable three month income. Yeah. And I realized that after losing my job, I didn't have enough financial knowledge to keep me in financial sanity, to keep me in the green. And now I have to do the work to build. Yeah. But also now that I run a business, it's small things, but significant things like how yeah. much tax you're paying, making sure that if you are charging VAT, it's only when you are actually claiming VAT back. It's ensuring that you are associating your rates accordingly and not yeah. undervaluing yourself. So I think finance for me has come from a place of real life, everyday stuff yeah. because at some point I lost all my money. Yeah. No, I get that. So that didn't happen to me, but my, I, I will talk about a trigger point, And that was when I become a parent, when I had my son, who's 13 now. And but so I, that was a trigger point. I wanted to go freelance because he hadn't been very well. And there was like no opportunity back then to kind of like have the flexibility in my job. So actually I did take a, you know, significant shortfall in income after that because I wasn't able to work as much, even as a freelancer, but and I actually at the time launched a blog at that time, realizing how important it was called Mommy Money Matters, which is a bit of a tongue twister. But that was really realizing that how difficult it is for mums out there when it comes to finances, but also how much complex information is out there and it's all over the place. Where do you go for like a one-stop shop? And one thing I think I would always say that's always been important to me, and I've actually managed to keep it, but it's not always been easy, is financial security. and mm -hmm. I. I get quite anxious when I can't, when I don't see that around me. So somehow I'm, even before that, but especially since becoming a parent, is I'm always looking to build systems around myself that gives me some sort of financial security. It's not just savings, but that could even be things like having insurance policies in place because I worry, you know, I think, oh, what if this happens? Like I've really got to have, I want to make sure I've got life insurance so that, you know, I don't leave my family if, you know, in trouble if I, if anything happens trying to think, think forever as well like just so a long-term game I'm, I'm short -term. such a long-term person but equally right now with the influx of social media and influencers of any kind it's a short-term game it's how do you get on that next holiday it's how do you save up for that next trip it's how do you get that luxury bag it's how do you get that credit card because you have to go on that temporary kind of endorphin releasing moment and you spoke about it earlier is at school, within the education system, we don't have financial literacy. And yet it's super easy for us to open up a credit card. And I, I said this um, a couple of weeks ago and it brought a lot of controversy around the table. But I was like, listen, if people, by, by people I mean companies, if companies are convincing you to open a credit card and if they are making it really easy for you, I think that they have responsibility to consumer to tell us how to best use it and how to pay off our bills. That caused a lot of controversy because the controversial point was, well, that's not their job because they're there to make money. And I like to think of myself as a social entrepreneur. And so I'm always thinking about impact and value and social good. And for me, it's like, how can you make this process so easy, but make the paying off so difficult, especially in a time where we are heading into a recession, even if they tell us we're not, we're kind of that, and that we are going through a cost of living crisis. It's too easy. Even platforms like Buy now, pay later. I was just going to go on to that. <laughs> I will let you go on to that. Otherwise, I will get super passionate. Wait, okay, so, so credit cards, yes, they make that way too easy. But it's a lot strict, a lot harder to get a credit card than it is to get buy now, pay later. Now, I spoke to a lot of people, a lot of young people, in fact, who got into serious financial difficulty because of buy, buy now, pay later, because they, they want that adrenaline rush. I want to get this and I'm going to get it now because buy now, pay later allows me to. And people, and it, it just becomes, I was speaking to someone, she said, oh, it's just so easy. And it just become like a habit. And I just kept buying stuff, buying stuff. And before I knew it, I'd accumulated thousands of pounds in debt, impacted my travel rating. My parents had to bail me out and it got really bad. Basically, she damaged her credit rating before she even, like in her twenties, you know, it was, you don't want to damage your credit score at that age. And so obviously things are going to change. They are changing with buy now, pay later, but that still continues to be problematic. Now, if you go online shopping now, any, pretty much any retailer, you know, you see the buy now, pay later, Klarna in pretty pink flashing up and it's just still so easy. Like, oh, okay, I'll just get that now. So I think that needs to be, you know, a little bit less easy because that is, that's, that's what's problematic right now as well. 
And I still think, even though it, you know, problems are becoming a bit more, there's a bit more awareness around it, it's still a problem. It's not gone away. It still continues to be a problem. And it's now they, you know, they clearly say it will affect your credit score. And that's been made a bit clearer. And the regulators have said as such. But there's still a lot of people using it and they still love it. And they don't really understand. There is a way to use it cleverly. I always say to people, like, the message is, if you need to buy something and the only way you can get it on buy now, pay later, then maybe you don't need to buy that. Because yeah. it depends on what you buy. It needs to, it can't be, it's that differentiation between want versus need, right? And I think that's a, a real important message for people to try and like, it is psychological, right? It's very hard. Like sometimes you just want something you want it to, right? But at the same time, if you are ordering a takeout and you can't buy a takeout today, then you don't need that takeout. If you are going on that holiday and you're doing buy now, pay later, but you don't actually know where you're going to get that money from in the future, then maybe don't do it. Social media, unfortunately, has a lot of trends going up, right? So mm -hmm. if you're trying to live this like loud luxury lifestyle, but you're not able to actually sustain that if you are renting if you are borrowing if you are dealing let's say but you want to portray the side start online i think that is only going to impact you negatively in the yeah. long term at the same time i know one card that has locked me in is american express because i purchase on american express i get the obvious points on ba i have my two for one companion voucher that's about do i say it off straight away same i do exactly that the same. has changed the game because prior to that for me, at least, I yeah. would not have a direct debit. And so there was a point in my life where I would maybe go when I'm like, oh, I owe this much, but I don't have this much. Now it's a matter of this is my budget. This yeah. is my structure. Paying it off that way. You've got accountants involved who are far more educated than I am. And there's a process. There's a yeah. policy in place. But I guess what I'm trying to say is there are cards or financial tools out there that actually can also support your lifestyle. I'm a big traveler. So if I can do that. Yeah and get a two-for-one companion voucher, which is not an advert because I'm still trying to figure out how to really make it work for me. Yes. I tweet them all the time and I don't really get much replies, you know? It's more <laughs> like that I can see being different from buy now, pay later. Yeah, absolutely. And I think credit cards, so like you, I, I put my purchases in credit cards because I take advantage of the perks and then I pay it off. Now, credit you can make credit cards work for you. Credit card companies probably don't like us, to be honest, because we're their worst customer. <laughs> uh, but... That's, that's a smart way of using money. So it, is, it does come down to smart money moves, right? But a lot of, I, don't, I think there are a lot of people who don't really see it that way. They see his credit card as, this is what I use for my emergencies. And I always say to people, your credit card is not your emergency money. That is how debt starts, right? Your emergency money should be a pot that you've put away. I say six months worth. Some people say three months worth. It's whatever you can start building to pay for lifestyle emergencies. I also have a little, a little budgeting, I call it a rule that I talk about. And it's, um, you get paid and people say, how much should I save? And I thought it's really hard to say how much you should save because what I save is different to what you might save. Um, so it's about how you might prioritize things. So you might say like 50% of your income must always go on bills, um, living costs, whatever they are, essential stuff. And then maybe you put 30% into savings and then or 20% to save it and leave a little percentage that is your, what I call a guilt-free fund. So that when you do spend, it's like really well budgeted. But do you have numbers on that? So do you have like, as an example, there's the 20, 30, 50 rule? Yeah, that is what I'm talking about. Yeah, the 20, okay. 30, 50 rule. So, so yeah, literally, so you'd put 50% of your um, income, you get paid income, X amount is reserved for the essentials, 30% on savings, long-term staff and 20% you accumulate, just put away for your, um, I say fun, like it's fun, fun needs, wants, whatever it is. So you don't have, you can spend without feeling guilty because how often do you hear people say, oh, I'm going to do this and I feel really guilty or I really don't have the money for it. It's, it's in that budget or it, or it doesn't happen. It shouldn't happen because like I said, I'm all about, it's good to have the security. It's good to have the financial resilience. It's also good that you're doing both because one, another important message about being good with money, so to put it, because people always say to me, I'm bad with money and no such thing, is really don't see it as something that stops you from having fun. It shouldn't stop you from enjoying your life. It's about using it as a tool so that you can make the most of everything that you want to do without it always being a struggle. And this is something that, you know, I really want to help people with as well. 
And investing comes is part of that and trying to understand why interest rates are great, but you shouldn't always chase it and why, and why that matters, why pensions matter. And, you know, people, you get someone in the under 30 or even under 40 will say, I don't need to think about a pension, you know, I'm not old yet, but actually you need to think about a pension when you're 20s to really get a good pension when you retire. And these are key messages. They're so important. And to me, that all comes down to the long term. I'm very long term focused because I think everyone can do the day to day stuff, which is also important, but you need to get that long term being built as well. You can't take your eye off that and you shouldn't. And I think when you're a freelancer, which you've been now yeah. for a while and I'm somewhat becoming, though I personally have a problem with the term freelancer, but we can talk about yeah. it another time. What are some top tips when it comes to finances yeah. that you can share? Yeah, great. So I don't freelance now, but I did, I did have a period of like eight years where I did freelance. I think my key one is just what I just touched on, paying to a pension. Now, this about 60% of self-employed people do not pay into a pension. But what if you are a director of your company and you've got a PAYE set up? Is that different? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, okay. But the, the point is that you can yes. uh, pay into a personal pension and you, and you should... Be putting in some money into and something. And does the pension come? Do you put that pension pot? So do you put that pot of money in your pension before you pay yourself? Before you? Is it like a taxable amount, or is it after tax? For argument's sake, you know, after tax, I have a hundred pounds, and twenty pounds is going to go to pension, or is it pre-tax? Yeah, I should probably ask the accountant, but I'd okay. say great. Um, probably, you know, when you get paid, allocate an X amount just to go straight Perfect. into your pension okay. first. So probably before tax, I mean, definitely before tax, I would say. But because you obviously get the tax uh, relief from that as well. So self-employed people don't benefit from money from their employer because, you know, I'm employed. I get money from my employer as well as my own contributions and I get the tax relief. Self-employed people get just the tax relief on that. So it's, it's such an important thing. But the key thing is it's about building for your future, future life. But people always say, I'll just work until I can no longer work. But... Anything can happen. Ill health can hit you at any point and you might be forced to stop working. So that's really important. But also, I'd say don't mix up your day-to-day -day finances with your business finances. And I think I initially did that. Like, you know, I'd get paid and it would just go to my normal bank account and I stopped doing it thinking, okay, this is really hard to manage. And also there's no separation from what you're earning to what you're spending on a what's your just day-to-day -day account, account. So business accounts are always a good idea. And if you don't want to pay fees associated with business accounts, then it's okay if you're just sort of a sole trader, maybe just have a normal current account, but keep it separate. It's going to be a lot easier to manage and stay on top of um, invoices. I'm terrible with invoices. I, I tell you, right, I get so many people complaining that, you know, just generally saying, oh, I don't get paid on time, et cetera. And that is a problem. Um, you know, businesses do owe it to people that they hire to pay them in good time. But it's, there is, there's always like, you know, payment runs and stuff that get in the way. So invoice, keep it organized. I remember I used to have like, I, I used to love, just love having a little file when I used to like stamp it as paid. And then I'd go through it every month from that, oh, that person hasn't paid me. But it's just so important to like, just keep on top of people. It is a sad part that you have to chase people you shouldn't have to, but. And invoice in good time is what I say. That's always a good, good, helpful thing for companies as well. Um, so that's some of the tips. And I'm also a big believer in making sure that you have your invoice T's and C's on the invoice. So I personally am not the best with admin. I'm, th there's various reasons for that, which we'll get onto. And if you follow me on the internet, you probably know. But invoicing is one thing that I might not be great at sending out straight away. So I've put all my T's and C's on the invoice. So it will say something along the lines of, here's my registration of company. Here's the bank details. Here's the terms and conditions of payment. But also, if there's a late payment, here's what I will charge you. Because it's on my invoice and yeah. because it's set in stone and because when you send it through, I've actually had, you know, company pay me just the same amount that they would have naturally paid me as a late yeah. payment because I yeah. had it on my T's and C's on my invoice and they can't really question it. According to the Bank of England, I might be wrong in saying this today, but generally the vibe is that you can charge X amount plus the interest rate or the inflation rate. It's something to check because obviously those T's yeah. and C's do change regularly. But again, with invoicing, when it comes to freelancers, stay on top of your invoicing, absolutely. Yeah. But also actually do the work 
I've also started using software tools, which before yeah, I was like, I was like, I can't do this. I'm not going to do it. And then I used it and I was like, yeah, this is really easy. Automation. Wherever you can put automation into your finances, I'm all for. Do you With, have any kind of suggestions or tips? Um, no, because only because I haven't freelance for years. So, but I do know like a lot of people um, use a lot of systems and they just have an automatic system that sends out invoices, etc. And I probably should know which ones, but I don't, I don't know what systems it yeah, actually use because everyone's got a different preference, I suppose. And but there's even apps, I suppose, that kind of let you keep you know, snap your receipts so that, you Absolutely. know. I know people who keep it in little envelopes or boxes and I was like, not sustainable. You need something that really just kind of, you know, especially, especially if you're sole trading, it does actually help with that end of year tax return because a lot of people don't, I, I want to say hire an accountant is probably a really good idea. A lot of people won't hire an accountant and then actually find it really difficult to do that end of year tax return. So if you're probably, you know, earning a fair amount and it gets complicated, then that's probably a fee worth paying because you can actually claim it back anyway. And also, um, so, at the yeah. end of the day, it's about thinking about your time versus effort. So I know that oh, when gosh, I first yeah. started my first year of business, I was like, listen, I am, I can do everything. I am amazing. I know how to do everything in the world. I did not. But that's just, you get very confident very quickly. You think, why am I going to spend X amount on an account when I can do the work? And I remember my mentor introduced me to an accountant which was great and I'm still with them today. And the accountants were like, we can do all of this. And I was like, no, 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 no. I don't want all of that because it's going to be too much money. I just want the third of it. And <laughs> they chased and they chased and they chased and they were following me on social media. And one day my accountant rang me up and I kid you not. And they were like, Sonia, I know you're not doing the work because I've seen the work you're doing on social media. And I know that you're yeah. super busy. So just think about the hours that you have to now invest to do this. And yeah. this is my day job. This is how much it's going to cost you. This is how much it's going to save you. Let's just come yeah. together. Time is money, right? And I value my time. I think time is almost more valuable than money, right? You, it's something you don't get back. You can't make up for it. So anything that saves me time is always going to be a winner. So whether that's an app, using an accountant, or using a system that automates your finances, I'm all for it. And actually the automation thing is something that everyone can do, whether you're a freelancer or self-employed and or whether you're employed everyone should have automation. Like I, I still, I am very surprised that people still wait for like a paper bill to come through the post and then they sit down and they go onto the computer and decide, like, oh, I've got paid by this date and put calendar dates. So like, just set up a direct debit, set up a standing order for your savings so you never forget money to go into your savings. Same with your investments, etc. Automation. Set reminders for things for your car insurance for renewal, you know, these little things, these are the short-term things that matter. To me, they matter. Like I just think, you know what, as a society, we need like, the same way people have half-term, I think we need a half-term from work just to do yeah. admin and get things into the diary. Like I'm personally now trying to do once a month, like a day where I'm just doing admin or maybe a week every quarter where I'm just doing admin and just getting on top of things. Because it's funny, it's like you stay on top of other things. Like, I know when I need to post on TikTok, I'm posting on Instagram, I'm sending a tweet out. But when it comes to the real stuff, I think just because we have so much consumption of information and so yeah. much stuff going on, we stray away from the big stuff, the importance of the boring stuff, because we're just trying to be excited all the time. Because it's so easy to do that, right? So it's so easy, easy to, to do your finances. And there's another term I use is have your give, you know have a money date once a month like if you've got a partner have it with your partner sit down together go for your finances make sure you're doing the best that you can with everything that you've got it's also an opportunity for people to talk about worries or concerns or you know share ideas whatever but or you know if you're single do it by yourself just sit down at least at least once a month and just just go through everything spend an hour or two sometimes you could just spend an afternoon. I, I remember spending an afternoon once and actually end up saving a thousand pounds because it was just like about switching deals and stuff around. And I was like, actually, and you know, save myself a thousand pounds, you know, because I did, and but I could have not done that, and that would have been quite a lot of money to not be saving. So it's just so so important to give yourself that time. A bit like when we get emails, right? As a journalist, and this is no joke. I get, if I'm off for a week, I would come back to thousands of emails and it's very hard to manage. Um, so this is just work-related emails, but equally my personal life get a lot of emails and it's very hard to keep on top of this stuff. But And therefore, but if you don't keep on top of it, it gets 
worse and worse and worse. And eventually, you know, like it's chaos, right? So, and it's the same with money. It's chaos. If you don't stay on top of it, it can become chaos. It can become problematic. So this is the thing. But also people don't want to look. That's There's, a, again, psychological element to this. People don't want to look at their finances. They don't want to know. It's better not to know. Um, and I, I used to be say, like that. I used to get really freaked out reading understand. my bank statements. And now I'm like, I will force myself to do it because I want to know if I'm actually efficiently spending. So a really good example is recently I unsubscribed to Canonby. So there's a free version, then there's a premium version. I was like, I don't need the premium version, but I'm saving myself 15 pounds a month, yeah. which might not look like a lot of money, but it is. But even from your trigger point perspective and being on top of finances, emails, admin, last year I lost a gig that was worth a thousand pounds because I replied back too late. Yeah. And you're looking at that being like, but I read that. I read it on my phone. Yeah. I just didn't reply back to it. All I had it to do was, in it. all I had to do was, receive this email, reply back in good time, or when is the deadline, you know? So yeah. making it really clear. We're talking about deadlines, we're talking about the boring stuff, admin, you've written a book all about finances called Invest Now. Writing can be fun, but it's also really time consuming. It is very time consuming. Brain drain, labor of love. Yeah. And what, <laughs> you made, you, so. and what made you want to then take your experience, your writing experience and actually Take, make it into a physical book. Yeah. So, okay, so I, I, I love writing about finance because obviously I've been doing it quite a long time. Always wanted to write a book and investing is one of my passions. Again, it always comes back, me looping back to how I'm always that thinking that long term. And But also, you know, I always see people talking about interest rates. We've had high inflation, low interest rates. Interest rates are going up, yes, but we still have very high inflation. So how do you grow that long-term wealth? And it's all about helping people grow that long-term wealth. And, but more importantly, I guess the trigger point for me was like, people always say things like, I'm not rich enough to invest. And I talk about this in my book, The Myths. Or they're like, oh yeah, that's not for people like me. And actually it's for everyone. Um, it's for you, it's for me, it's for everyone we know. And it only takes small amounts to build wealth. And it all comes down to, Little and often, right? It's a bit like exercising. You, you know, if you do it consistently, you will see results. And it's like that with investing. It's got to be consistent. It can be small amounts, whatever, whatever you can afford. And so I just really wanted to put that. But I wanted to use my journalism experience. The one thing I'm really good at is just breaking down the jargon and making it relevant and so that the everyday person on the street can read it and think, oh, I get what she's saying, sort of thing. I do want to make it like a business book or anything like that. So yeah, so there was Invest Now. So, and you know, the editor was absolutely amazing to work with. And did your publisher approach you? Yes, I was approached by the publisher. So and then you built a proposal? I built a proposal. So that's usually the process. So it was interesting because the publishers had been following me for quite a while. Cause I, I probably do less now, but at the time I was doing quite a lot on social media always. I do quite a lot of social media. I talk about money. My social media account is about what I do as a financial journalist, talking about things that are happening and stuff. So, but that was a part of it in a way. Like, had I not been doing that, um, I probably wouldn't have been noticed. If you so see your what personal I mean. and professional brand were really important, imperative Absolutely. in someone approaching you. Exactly. So, what is the process there for you? So, build up your credentials. Yeah. Yeah, so my credentials were like really important there. So, I got approached by the publisher. I spoke to them and kind of then put forward a proposal. And yeah, and then, so even though you get approached by a publisher quite often, you probably know this, you still need to sell it. They still need to think, oh, actually we like that. So they may approach you with an idea or suggestion or just say, we want to work with you, but you still got to sell the idea to them. They've still got to, you know, get the, the vote of confidence from the rest of the team. So I managed to get that and did a, a couple of sample chapters of what it might look like, what direction it will go. And after that, I think it's all become a blur because I was actually writing two books at the time. And so, it, yeah, and then after that, I think I spent loads of time in the library <laughs> and hiding away, like pretending you're like, I felt really bad, like when you've got children and you, know, and you don't end up going to certain events. But for me, what it was, it was also, I could write when I could write. And sometimes I find inspiration at random time of the day. 
at midnight and I'm like, I really want to write this, I need to write it. So I would end up doing silly things like that. And but most of it, I would just consider myself like weekends. I just spent a lot of time in the library, a lot of evenings. So it's tiring. But do you know what? It's the main thing is, if you're passionate about it, it's the passion that drives you. If you write, if someone asked me to write about, I don't know, writing, creating podcasts or something, you know, I probably wouldn't, like as much as I enjoy speaking on them Absolutely. and as much as I love them, but it's not my day-to-day -day passion. Like investing was a passion, money is a passion. So I think if you write from the heart, it's sincere and you put your best foot forward and you will deliver on something that's worthwhile. So I would say to someone, if you're going to write a book, make sure it's something that you genuinely, you know, have a heart for, otherwise it's going to be really, really it's great tough. advice. Yeah. And there's two, there's, there's a few bits to writing a book. Um, and we've spoken about this with numerous order, authors on the podcast already. And we've got a few more coming, which is great. But sometimes you don't even get a prepayment for a book. And so when you go back to time is money, you've really got to think about is, is it worth investing six months, nine months writing that book? and then being paid five to 10% in royalties. Or the second option is that you are paid in advance of some kind, yeah. but you're therefore not paid royalties until you wipe out that advance. Most people don't know that if you're writing a book to get rich quick, it is not, not the happening. avenue to go down. No, it's definitely not the avenue to go down. So it's a lot of people just say to me, oh yeah, so you've written two books, so you can relax now. And I was like, no, you don't make like loads and loads of money out of a book. However, um, and that's why it comes down to you've got to do it because you really genuinely want to do it from the heart. And otherwise, yeah, otherwise it's just a chore and you might not get the rewards for it. It's always good. Like I would say to people, if you can join the Society of Authors because they can also help. And there's a lot of advice there that you can go to. So if you are in the process of writing a book, um, you might be able to join back. There is a fee to join, but I would say that for me is worthwhile. And and speak to as many people as possible because people will just say, oh, I've been offered this much of a fee for my book. Is it good? But actually it's a very, it's a very wide question because there's so many different types of books, there's so many different types of publishers, and it's all about the audience that you're targeting, et cetera. So if you write, you know, you might be writing the next Harry Potter <laughs> or, you know, for example, and you might write one, but your next one's going to be like, you're going to negotiate a massive deal after that. So yeah, it just, it really depends. And it also depends on who you are. So that building a profile, people always say to me, what can I do to build myself? And I would always say, it's really important to build your own brand and your own profile. And that's something that I've worked on for years. And this isn't always just about just because you want to write a book. It could be just because you're starting a business or whatever you do, that personal profile, you're building your brand is so important. So, you know, if you're just planning to just sit in a corner in a room day in, day out and be very silent and quiet, that's going to be hard, especially nowadays where people find you primarily on social media. That is a fact, right? You know, because you've built your brand on social media. I know because I've had opportunities come to me via social media. We probably somehow know each other via social media. So that important, I'm not saying it's all about social media, but it is about brand building. And I think anyone, whatever they want to achieve in life, think about how you're going to come across to the world out there and how you're going to do that. So we've spoken a lot about personal branding and social media, the credibility and the credentials you need to activate opportunities, which are super valid. We've spoken about tech, future trends. We've spoken about freelancing money, financial hack, and now also actually authorship, which is great. I feel like we've covered quite a lot within a kind of short form conversation. But for those who are listening, thinking, Calvin, you've shared some great advice already. What are some top financial tips that you would like people to go out and work on today yep. that will actually help to transform their lives? Yeah, so first thing is, oh, there's so many, I don't know, we actually know where to start now. And so I would say first things first is have a look at your finances. If you've been putting it off, go into your bank account, have a look. Have a look at what's coming in and what out. I'm not into like budgeting and dwelling on the past. Let's not do that. Let's look forward. Okay, this is um, what I need for my day-to-day -day living costs. This is what's coming in. This is what I'm spending on. If you need to make cuts, where can they be making cuts? Can you get better deals? Things like Simple things like insurance and broadband. You can save hundreds immediately. If you're the type of person saying to someone, I'm always bad with money, well, let's just get out of that mindset. 
And actually, I also think people do need to take a certain level of responsibility for your finances. No one's going to fix it for you. You do need to fix it for yourself. Uh, if you've got debt, think about how you might start paying that off. And I say that because we are living in a difficult period at the moment. And if you're in a position where you can start saving, start building some sort of emergency fund, that's really important to avoid future debt. Um, and then get on to building your future wealth, which, which can be done by investing. So start with a stocks and shares ISA, for example, and start thinking about what can I put in there per month, each month. And if you're not sure how to get started with investing, then uh, I was just, I'm going to hold this up, right? So I really explained this in Invest Now, you know, how to get started, what, you know, what it, what it is to invest, what does it mean? Because... And also just get out of that mindset that it's only for rich people because it's for everyone. And you can start by, you can actually start with a pound, right? But I would say to be, for it to be meaningful, you might want to put something like 20 or 25 pounds a month minimum if you can, but you can get the ball rolling with a pound. So, and, you know, I, I sometimes get people say, oh, I don't actually have that money, but they subscribe to things like Amazon Prime, but they don't use it. So that's what I mean by looking for your finances and thinking about what do I actually really need? And if you don't need it, ditch it. Even if it's for the short term, put your finances in a strong position first. And, and also just, it's a bit of psychology here when it comes to managing money. Just get into that mind. Like I said, stop telling yourself and other people that you're bad with money. Let's just get out of that and start looking forward and thinking about how you're going to avoid the problems that you've been facing. And yeah, follow the right people as well. And my final question to you, uh, just because you touched on parenthood earlier, we haven't had the time to really delve into that topic, but for parents who are listening or potential parents, how can they start these conversations at home, uh, especially with their own kids or their siblings or you know, members yeah. of their own family? Because I think a lot of financial conversations do or should start at home and they yeah. should be rooted at home, but they're definitely not. They should be. Oh, they 100% should be. So I've actually written a book about money and kids, how to just, just a like, picture book kind of tells you what money is so get your kids to look at things like that as well um now money is a taboo subject right it always has been but it should it should not be and it isn't i i don't think any children should be nervous about asking about money it's, it's when you can ask the question is when you learn so have conversations at home they don't need to be serious conversations right so it could just be being letting them look at money see it let, letting them Talk when you go to the shops, if they're really young, talk about how much things cost and look at the change that you've got, let them pay for something. Like actively getting them to think about money and they don't learn it at school. So that conversation is always at home. I think I'd be open about money. I talk to my children about money and sadly, um, as a financial journalist, they don't escape it. They hear conversations in the house all the time and let them, you know, look at what's in your bank account or let them ask the questions. And if you don't know the answers, find the answers and let them read books about it, let them read books about it, but don't see it as a taboo subject. That's the most important thing because I have heard people at a dinner table that I've been at saying, oh, we don't ask that, that's rude. But actually it's okay. If they want to know about something, that's fine. And they, they may ask something like, oh, how much do you earn? But as parents, I think that's okay to discuss that with your children. Why not? Like, why is it a taboo subject when they ask that? It's not rude, I think it's fine. Uh, so yeah, conversations like that, I'd just say don't close the kids off, let them be part of your financial journey. Thank you. And my final question, and we ask most, if not all of our guests, and definitely when I remember to ask is, what would your career advice be to your younger version of yourself or a younger member of the audience who is definitely listening, who is at the start yeah. of their investment, finance and money journey? Yeah, so I'm going to say it's going to be about uh, negotiate your pay. And I want to say that because I know when I started off, I started off on a way too low a salary because I just wanted to be a journalist. Hadn't thought about actually, are people taking advantage of my desire to be a journalist? But and I hear this so many times. And don't be afraid to negotiate because you should and do it. And then also ask questions. And one thing I, I see sometimes people starting jobs and they're very quiet and they have questions but they don't ask the questions don't be afraid to ask questions if you're going to build your career you're going to build your profile ask questions be nosy it's your opportunity to learn and develop and take it thank you so Kalpana obviously we're here also promoting raving out about your book how can people get in touch with you personally and where can they find your books and in which stores yep 
So you can probably find me on social media, um, Twitter with no blue tick, sadly, at Calpina Fits, which is on Instagram and TikTok as well, but be quiet on TikTok at the moment. Um, and the book is on pretty much every bookshop. So Amazon, Waterstones, wherever you buy your book from, basically. So Calpina, thank you so much for coming, thank for you. sharing your wisdom, for sitting on our couch with us and for making us all a little bit more smarter when it comes to money. Great, good to be here. Thank you.